right, let's talk about AEW for November 29th, and we're not going to talk about a lot of details. We're going to talk about a lot of psychology and ask a lot of questions like why and what the f but did you enjoy the color commentary by Parata Danielson? No. I actually did not like his commentary. It was like Bruno San Martino in the 80s. <laughs> What'd you think of this, Bruno? Oh, he got them in a headlock, and then uh, he's very tough. Like, there's nothing said. There's, it's, like, it's like a baby-faced Tony Schiavone. Nothing really is said. But, you know, we... And what a baby-faced Tony Schiavone. Like, Tony Schiavone isn't a baby face. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? Just like another <laughs> guy saying nothing... And I don't know, and then he gets like the voice just doesn't, I don't know. I didn't like Danielson on commentary. Well, but also we have been told he had a broken orbital socket and there was rumors he was going to come back maybe and wear a mask as Undertaker has done or as other people, the protective mask when you break your face. But he comes back wearing the fucking pirate eye patch. And, and he'll wrestle in it also, as we'll talk about, you know, later. And it, it, it something was, I don't know, that was off-putting. So how many wrestlers have we seen in AEW with eye patches? Moxley, Adam Page, that's two. But I feel like there's been more. Well, anybody that gets misted, probably, if they show up in the next week or two to follow up on it, that's rare, but it does happen. That's true. And, uh, but, but anyway, we'll come back to it. So the first match is a tournament match, and I've got to ask you, what the fuck with these graphics? And the blue division and the gold division and the, the again, the, the, the graph that goes out and vertical and horizontal. We talked about it some on the drive through But looking at this, is anybody going to get this? Is anybody going to give a shit enough to try to pay attention to this? I understand it's the round robin type of tournament, the G1 in Japan and Tony now, he has the, I guess they, they're using a point system like they score they use in the football leagues over in the UK. And Tony even came out in an interview and said, Brian Danielson always wanted to do the G one tournament in Japan, but he doesn't want to leave his kids for a month. So this way he gets to do one. So are they just ignoring the fact that the American fans are want and are used to and are educated to, at best, a single elimination tournament, but they've had so many of those that the tournament idea is meaningless, so now they're going to make the tournament idea more complicated that nobody's going to be able to follow these random fucking matches and remember who beat who except for this goddamn graphic that looks like a fucking Rubik's cube that's unfinished on the fucking screen. Help me. There are fans that think if new Japan and all Japan at their peak were in English, that would have been enough to open the accessibility to the North American wrestling fan. But there are certain elements that work better for Japanese wrestling than they do for what is predominantly American wrestling. It's a reading culture. It's a culture that reads the newspaper. We used to do that. It's a culture that reads the newspaper. It's a culture that reads books and magazines. They can keep up with that stuff. The only way anyone's keeping up with any of this is on AEW's own program, where last week Excalibur couldn't even explain it. <laughs> yeah, the, he, was, he was groping for the phrase single elimination tournament, and I think he, he was like, he settled on, was it not something where you just get beat and go home or something like that? I mean, the other interesting thing is if it's an annual thing, that means every year they expect the end of November and December to be eaten up with this tournament. I say eaten up because it eats up a ton of segments on your show that wouldn't be applied to any feuds or programs. It's all about matches for points in the system. It'll be interesting. And again, I, I said this the other day, there's a difference between what they do on Wednesday and Saturday. If the tournament idea works, we'll start seeing Saturday show improvement, I would think, in the next couple weeks. Within the next couple weeks. There should be improvement this week because there's no Survivor Series. But next week will be the big test. But if Dynamite just stays where it is, then it hasn't done anything. Oh, it's done something. It's killing off a bunch of fucking talent. The first tournament match on this program was the plumber, Moxley, against Jay Lethal. 
And by the way, shout out to the nice Cult of Cornet member in the Cornet face T-shirt that was hooting at the plumber on his entrance through the through the crowd. I wait, he's gonna be he's gonna be the first guy in the fucking modern wrestling era to get knifed by a fan, not because he has heat. They're just sick of seeing him walk through there like a dumbass. With a security guard next to him. So I mean, how badass are you? Yeah. Yeah, we needed the security guard. We needed cops with guns and nightsticks and mace and billy clubs and pepper spray and fucking handcuffs and goddamn automatic assault rifles. I don't Uphill need both ways. I just walk through the crowd. You can tell by the way I walk. You can tell by the way he moves his junk that he's a plumber's man with no time to talk. Well, that's better than anything I could have come up with. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I uh, here poor Jay Lethal and the ship has now sailed. An athlete like Jay Lethal in there with a freight hopping hobo like John Moxley. And I I don't like the plumbers matches to begin with. I didn't want to watch them very lethal anymore. I knew what was going to happen here. And basically the finish was Moxley gives him a pile driver and gets a two count because he kicks out and then just turns over and puts a fucking rear choke on him and makes him tap out. You couldn't even save the goddamn guy's somewhat a little bit of his integrity or credibility by getting beat by a pile driver. Now he can kick out of that and then I'll just choke him out, flattered in four o'clock. And who was the heel to begin with? Because there is no heel. It's just two athletes for points. Uh, get those points. Well, they didn't get any points with me, either one of them. And it's a shame that Jay Lethal has been put in this position and wasted like this. But it's too late to, to do anything about it now. Is one of the problems with these kind of tournaments, and again, it works differently in Japan than I think it would traditionally here with a North American fan base, but we'll see how it does with AEW. It's one of the problems that there always has to be at least one guy who loses every match. Well, I'm not even talking about this specific result of this specific match with Jay Lethal. I'm talking right. about from the time he was brought in, no, he got I understand. on television multiple times and put in a goofy group where he's a flunky guy. And there, truthfully, I've not goddamn read Tony's map to determine whether it's possible that that you know that or necessary, I should say, that somebody has to get beat every fucking time. And I'm not even saying with the way that Moxley's been presented in this company that it would be outrageous for him to ever beat Jay Lethal. If Jay Lethal had been presented properly, to begin with, it wouldn't hurt him as bad as it does now to just come out again in one of the few singles matches he ever gets to have anyway and just get choked out like a fucking putz. Because this guy thinks he's fucking Hoist Gracie. But he looks like Gracie Allen. Anyway, speaking of looking like goddamn shit, speaking of looking like the goddamn beast that ate Seattle, Eddie Kingston, did you see the interview where he was sitting in a hallway in the back after a, I assume, hard-fought victory? <laughs> He's sitting on a concrete floor, leaning on a fucking block wall in a hallway of an arena with his shoulder straps down and his stomach it looked like he was nine months pregnant and the camera was down with him shooting him at the most unflattering fucking angle possible this guy didn't look like he would be just if you were flipping by the channel i know nobody does that anymore but if you came upon a wrestling program that you had never seen before and were told this guy was one of the fucking wrestlers you would laugh and move on or do the production people not have eyes? It wasn't even about the content of his promo. It's about he was sitting there looking like the biggest, fattest, amateur, drunk, fucking tough man, piece of shit, mechanic. They, they can't make stars. They can't even make the guys that they've got that look good look good. And they make the guys they've got that don't really look good look worse. It was a good promo, though. <laughs> and then, uh, did you notice on the announce desk, Brian, 
there are three cans of woo, not three six packs, three cans of woo on the announce desk with a partition in between the announcers and the drinks so that the announcers can't possibly reach them to drink them on the air. And the viewer at home can't even see what they are. And then no, and they never get a close up. You know, if you know what they are, you recognize the can shape and the colors, but otherwise it it might be Pringles, but uh, <laughs> I'm I'm at a loss to explain why it looks like a display that's been left unfinished. If they're going to put them up there, put enough up there to fill the screen or put a fucking placard or a three. They're not even a six pack. Yeah, not put even three a out. <laughs> well, I know it's because doctors advise that you only drink one of these a fucking day and there's three announcers there, but they could. <laughs> They could say, they could give a disclaimer down at the bottom. Warning, announcers have been warned not to drink any of these while on live television for fear of possible FCC repercussions. You think the money guy's like talking to Rick? Hey, can you say something to Tony? What's going on with the sponsorship? Hey, don't worry about it. Woo! And then well, nothing I, happens. Well, they, they went from that desk shot to Tony with uh, Shivani with Sting and Flair. And they're talking, and March 3rd, they made the announcement, and this is, I think, very apropos, and at least Tony's done something now that they can market potentially in the in the actual area they're going to do the event in. March 3rd, his retirement takes place in Greensboro at the Coliseum. And I would think because of the level of, of interest and, and knowledge of wrestling that a lot of the media still has down there and Flair's name and Sting's name and the Greensburg Coliseum, they'll be able to sell this locally to maybe sell some fucking tickets. But nevertheless, did you see that the suit that Flair was wearing made him look like a gold-wrapped Godiva white chocolate? You would almost think he has a much younger girlfriend who's just playing tricks on him or something, the way he dresses. Well, no, hey, silly wabbit. Tricks are for kids. These suits are for grown-up adults. I've never seen... I hope he lives to be 100, but I've never seen a man that age dress in in Christmas wrapping paper. I always wanted to be the Mad Hatter. Woo! <laughs> it was a weird, the, was a weird what... energy promo, wasn't it? Like the whole pre -ta It was definitely pre-taped, I think. Well, yes. The whole energy of it was like slow and weird, and then Flair started doing his thing. Well, see, that's the thing because it's a pre-tape, and and Sting has never been the promo guy, and you know he was putting Flair over and being all nice, and you could tell that Rick knew it needed to come up a notch a little bit. And I mean, I, you know, I don't know how many notches Rick has these days before he hurts himself, but goddamn. As he was putting Sting over and getting more into it, he turned six shades darker of red facially. I mean, he started out as, as he had normal skin tone. And my God, I thought my TV was going on the blink by the end of the thing. He was glowing. He just had a strawberry woo energy. It turns you red. <laughs> Imagine if he had the uh, lemon one. It's like that urine pill JR gave me that one time. It turned my piss red. I almost took myself to the hospital. <laughs> but anyway, that's it. You know, so there you have that. And then we were ready for well, the next tournament match. Well, go ahead. You had something else you wanted to ask. Any other thoughts about doing the pay-per-view in Greensboro? Yeah, ag again, it, I mean, Should the they give a ringside ticket to John Hitchcock? Oh, just so he'll bring a decent sign, possibly. There's no way they could do that event without him with a sign. He was at a sign. He had signs for that specific event they're referencing in '88. Well, sign, signs everywhere, a sign blocking out the scenery. But never the <laughs> no. Then they get. They should get all of front row section D. Find Casey O'Connor out there in Wyoming. Um, but no, I I don't know. I I, I bet you Hitchcock will be there. Because he pr probably can't miss seeing Flair and staying in person one more time. But that's the thing. The pay-per-view is going to do whatever the pay-per-view does based on whatever they put on it and how they build it. So we know that, and uh, that's up in the air, and it's coming two months after the end of the world as we know it.
and Tony feels fine on December 30th, so they're coming back two months later. I do not, I don't know how much Sting's retirement at this point match is going to add to their pay-per-view buys of the audience that normally doesn't buy their pay-per-views. I got to get this one. But I'm saying that they will probably get more significant interest in the local market and the local area for the live event than they normally have been because of who's involved in that. But as we've kind of seen, the the AEW fans that, that buy the pay-per-views, they're going to buy the, their pay-per-views are always within the same range, except when they did the two-a-week-apart deal back in August and September. September fell in half, I guess. Looks like Joe Biden dressed like Billy Graham. Oh, superstar Billy Graham. Late Not even the evangelist. Superstar Billy Graham, yeah, where he wore suits and his tie-dyed pants became like a tie-dyed shirt. And then it became a tie-dyed diaper. And a tie-dyed wheelchair, and he was dying for like 35 years, 40 years. You know, there has to be, and we're not making mockery of Superstar. He was a legend and an icon. We make mockery of everybody, but there has to be some kind of goddamn Guinness World Record there for being at death's door for half of your fucking life. He literally, he was 80 years old, right, or the, thereabouts, close to, and he literally was sick and in and out of the hospital and or fearing for his life and getting organ transplants for the past 40 years. Yeah. Since 1989, he's been on death's door. Literally since 89, he's been saying, like, ah, it can happen at any time. And now yeah. it happened. Well, I don't know why we're laughing about this. No, we shouldn't be laughing, but it's going to happen sooner or later. So you might as well predict it. Ric Flair doesn't know how to be old man Ric Flair. I'm not even talking about in real life. I'm talking about on camera. Watching the promo, it was too much for this promo. Like he got all fired up for no reason. He yeah, never, well, there was he never did. like just mindless getting fired up. There were casual, let me tell you what I'm going to do, those kind of things. I'm not saying this needed to be that, but. No, the, the reason he did it is because he knew that it had been deadly fucking dull so far to that point, and he overcompensated. He That's sure what did. I believe. He sure did. What do you think of this Flair run managing Sting so far? Are they getting anything out of it? What? I don't, they're just, they're, they've done a couple of interviews together. Who's, how is he managing Sting? What, what have they done at the ring with Flair being a manager or, or besides he got in a little boxing match with Christian Cage? It's not a run of him managing. It's a run of him showing up at random places to talk about the retirement match. It would blow the fans' minds. They should have him come out next week with women on each arm. People oh, lose good Lord. their yes. shit. Oh, people will go crazy. Oh, that He's a pervert! Fantastic. He's a pervert! He should never be and, near women! And they should be wearing stewardess outfits. Oh, no. See, that's too far. You've taken it way too far. You've taken <laughs> well, it way... See, it's too soon. Too soon. Too soon. But... They should be the original models that he used at the Clash of Champions in 89 with the oh. Aqua Steamboat. If they could find them, dress them up like stewardesses, they're all 70. Then what would they say? <laughs> at least he's sticking to people of his own age group. You got to admire that. Where did they get those girls? Like for Bash 89 when he comes out for the funk match and he had whatever, like six girls, three on each arm. Where'd they find those girls? No, they would call modeling agencies. Those women had no idea who the, who we were, who Flair was, who any of these people. Yeah, a, a few of them found out who he was after the fact, but they were just hired to be models. That's why they didn't look... They didn't look like any of our hot female fans. They looked like phony fucking magazine cover models because they were making themselves up and shit to get on magazine covers, not to get laid by the fucking boys. So our female fans were actually hotter, but they were all dolled up better, more professionally. But nevertheless, yeah, I've heard I would, you know, dictate that somebody call get sex models for Ric Flair. And blah, blah. So they didn't know what the fuck was going. That's why they stood there with those blank looks on their faces and just <laughs> lined up in line as he would come by or whatever. Bash 89, when he does like the first woo, one of the girls turns to the other girl and she's never heard of it before. She goes, woo. <laughs> anyway, we come back to the tournament. Are you ready to come back to the tournament? Oh, yeah. It's like we never left. 
Do you think that the listeners of our program mind that we don't take any of this fucking shit seriously anymore? I don't think they do either anymore. All right. So Mark Briscoe against Rush in the tournament. So now Mark Briscoe, who if Tony Khan had any fucking clue whatsoever of how to build a star, he could have slotted in as his top gimmick babyface a year ago, and it would have worked. With the way he can work and the way he can talk and the groundswell of support right after Jay's accident, the people would have loved Mark Briscoe, and he's different than everything else on this program and every other program. And they flopped that too, and they dropped that ball, and they fucked Mark Briscoe up. And he's still as good as he ever was, but now he's on TV a year later with no momentum, having no major wins, and putting over an obnoxious no selling glory hound. And Rush didn't treat Mark Briscoe like he did Jungle Boy because he knows better. But Rush cannot talk. He can't, he can't, I don't think he can speak Spanish. He has no psychology in the ring. He does moves back and forth. He's one-tenth of the money that Mark Briscoe could be as a personality in the wrestling business with proper booking. So naturally, Rush is getting the push. And it, they're serious. It wasn't silly, and the shit looked good, but it was two guys hitting each other with moves back and forth because Mark's not the kind of guy that's going to tell Rush, hey, you don't know how to work and listen to fucking me but he's going to get some of his shit in too, so that's what it was. And Rush gave him a suplex into the turnbuckle, hit him with a forearm and a drop kick to the face and covered him one, two, three. So just a horrible finish, just beat him flat and in a boring fashion. No heel cheating, nothing to protect the baby face, nothing to get heat on the heel. Just flat as fuck. Thank you, Mark Briscoe, wasted opportunity. You can go back in your hole now until we need somebody else to do a job. And here's this other motherfucker moving on, or not moving on, but scoring points in the tournament that is never going to draw us 15 cents in Chinese money. Brian, your thoughts? I thought it was okay while it lasted. You know, Rush wrestles, and I'm not saying he's not a badass, because I hear that he may be, but he wrestles, like we always say, like one of the road warriors. And you get away with that if the promoter wants you to do that. So then you ask yourself, what's the future for Roosh in AEW? His faction's terrible, but he's all right. He's a former, I think, uh, Ring of Honor champion. But there's not really a big clamoring for him. But with that said, it's not against him. There's not a big clamoring for anyone. I don't really get excited to see Mark Briscoe anymore. And I always know he's going to lose. Yeah. I always know he's going to lose. He's Jay Lethal. Yes. All, all these guys came out of Ring of Honor and now they're just Tony's job guys. Ring of Honor has become Tony's job company. It barely exists. The match was okay. The fans that are attending there seem to be into the tournament this week, or at least these matches, these hard hitting matches. What does it accomplish? Time will tell. Well, only time will tell if we stand the test of time. It's a hell of a test. And, and for go. the record, I think Roosh can speak Spanish. I don't know why you said that. No, he's You're the he's of Andrade. The, oh, Andrade's the one's got marbles in his mouth. Yeah. Ah. Well, Rush can speak Spanish, but he can't speak English. Well, nevertheless, um, so it was flat. It was flat as fuck, is what it was. And then RJ City was in black and white with Tony Storm and Luther and Maria May and I don't, I don't know what to say anymore. She's very entertaining at what she does, but, and I can, I can take her having the butler and it's, it's the only use of Luther we've seen, but now she's only been doing this thing like six weeks and they, she's already got the fucking girl that's going to cause the issue. And as we mentioned before, now everybody else is playing along with her. And and Renee Moxley Good and RJ City did the awards presentation thing the other day, the other night on the show. And and nobody's 
it, it doesn't work if everybody doesn't think she's insane, right? I just think it doesn't work. You could stop there. It's, it's, I gone, gave it, it's gone too far now. I gave it a chance early on. It's too far and cringy and bad now. And the problem is RJ City, who I like, Renee, who, you know, loves who's, doing who's these Renee? things. Who's Renee? Renee, who's Renee. It just seems like all these people are treating it like it's pro wrestling talent show. Hey, I want to do skits. I want to do comedy. I want to do these segments. None of it's good. None of this Tony Storm stuff is good now. She's talented. I used to say this about Bray Wyatt. She should go to Hollywood. Yeah. And, she, and she's actually good in the ring. But she should go to Hollywood. Because she could act. And she's into it. She could lose herself in a character. And I hope she loses that character right off this fucking show. <laughs> if I have to watch it. Well, speaking of losing his character. What do you think about our boy MJF? Is this the version of MJF that absolutely no one ever wanted to see? And are they starting to realize it? I think there have been mistakes made with MJF's booking probably since he became world champion, but specifically since the Adam Cole stuff started and then really since Adam Cole got hurt. The Juice Robinson thing was a disaster, like we mentioned earlier. The tofu thing backfired, and now you have heels able to use that against MJF as something that was lame that he tried to do to them. That doesn't help him. He's involved in multiple feuds with multiple people, which is, in a sense, good for a world champion, but some of this stuff you just don't want to see him in. And sometimes he gets serious, and then they go right to Roddy Strong or something, and it takes away the seriousness. The devil thing, and we can talk about that in a little while, is the Black Scorpion. Unless yep. it's a magnificent payoff. And that's hard to do. It's going to be a disaster. And, 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 and by the way, I heard David Mamet was on real time. He was. He, he, was, said he was great that, uh, this week. He was great this yeah, week. He said, who was it? Was it Aristotle he quoted that said, a good ending is both shocking and inevitable. It can't just be shocking. If they pull out something just completely ridiculous out of left field because nobody would have ever thought that, that doesn't mean it's good. And that's what the Black Scorpion was. That's what this might be. But MJF has lost a lot of steam. I've said it before. I think he's probably been too good of a team player over there. I know they wanted to get Jay White over for the main event feud. A, to me, it didn't work, and B, MJF shouldn't have been doing a job to Jay White to build into the match because no one <sighs> thought Jay White was going to beat him and keep the belt. So you don't give away the loss to set up the bout that people don't care enough about already. And they need to do some kind of reset. Not a reset, but there needs to be a new course. And I don't know exactly how you get there. I mean, if MJF's hurt and he's going to need surgery... He's a young guy and he's in, seems like he's in good shape. Hopefully he heals fast, but maybe that time off TV would be good. Well, who knows whether he'll be off TV. Adam Cole, goddamn, they practically yeah. amputated his fucking leg. He can't get a week off. And MJF's a much bigger star for AEW and AEW fans than Adam Cole. So I don't know if Tony would try to get him on TV every week, even after surgery. And quite frankly, MJF may want to do that. But right now there are severe booking problems with MJF. And I think a lot of stuff was overthought. And they haven't done him any favors. Well, and also, to be honest, and by the way, before we address what actually was said in this promo, and then we'll talk about what happened afterwards, but I, I thought when I first heard he was hurt, I, well, no wonder that elbow off the top, and you could only blame MJF for doing that when the table or the, the announce desk had collapsed and the guy was laying flat on the fucking floor, he comes off the top rope with an elbow, lands on his fucking hip on nothing but concrete and wood. I'm thinking, well, he fucked himself up. Apparently it's not his hip. It's his shoulder, which I know it was in my notes. Did we even reference that at one point they did some deal where Jay White gave him some kind of flying dingbat off the top rope and put him right down, right on his left shoulder. And, uh, and the only reason I didn't, wasn't more concerned about that was because the 
the big bump took all the wind out of the fucking room. But that had to be, if he's got an injured shoulder, that's where it came from. Jay White grabbed him, they did the fucking flip thing off the top, and he put him down on his goddamn left shoulder. Yeah, you and I had the same reaction when we heard that he may be hurt. Oh, it must be his hip. Yeah. So, But anyway, he comes out, he's got his cane again, more on that in a minute, but he talks about his injury, torn labrum in his shoulder, and he's talking about Samoa Joe, but he, he's putting him over. He's saying he respects Joe because Joe came here to AEW not to line his pockets, but because he believed in AEW. Even if you want to rah-rah, and, and, and MJF is smart enough to know that the core AEW fan group wants to rah-rah AEW, and it's the... The old ECW thing, you know, we're rebellious, you know, all hands on deck. You don't need to hear that from MJF, the person. He shouldn't care. He should call Samoa Joe a sucker because he didn't come here to line his pockets just because he believed in AEW. Hey, I came here and called fucking Tony Khan a fucking Mark and I make more money than you do, Joe. That's MJF, whether you like it or not. And he shouldn't be out there doing the rah-rah shit like every other goddamn... It's not right, right psychologically. It's almost like he's going through this therapy and learning to be a nice person who just didn't trust anyone because he had a hard time making friends. My God, it's, it's making him a sap. A childish, emotional sap like the rest of these fucking people. And he, again, he talked about seeing Joe in TNA and said WWE dropped the ball on him by, by name mentioning WWE. But he praised Joe to the heavens and thanked him for paving the way. It's not what the people wanted to hear from MJF, even then when he started putting himself over. This is, it, this MJF would not have gotten over like the other MJF did if this was the first we saw of him. I've said this before, I stand with it. But he, you know, he put himself over, but he still said that, that Joe was the toughest opponent he'd ever had, but December 30th is about his legacy, and he promised everybody, despite all the injuries, he's going to show the world it's the size of the fight and the dog, and to take the... The belt away from me, Joe, you'll have to put me down. And then he breaks his cane over his knee for emphasis. And then the lights go out. And before we talk about what happened next, other comments on this interview, if any? I mean, not really. I, mean, I like the idea of MJF working with Samoa Joe. I just hate the way the actual... I hate the way we're actually getting there. The, the match is being set up. You can't stay. You love the match. You hate the... I love the match. I love the energy. The build. I love the energy between the two. It's just the words they're actually saying and the actions that are actually <laughs> happening are terrible. I, I can't wait to beat you. I'm going to protect you. Yes, I'm going to protect you until you get well so that then, that's what the heel is saying. And then I can beat you. And the baby face is swearing to everybody that he'll have to kill him to beat him. But we, we want Samoa Joe and, what does and it mean? And what does it mean to believe in AEW? What the hell does that even mean? Well, see, that's that's the the little fucking treehouse club that these really hardcore fans have. It was the same thing with Ring of Honor, same thing with AEW. TNA had some of them. Where it's like, oh, it's it's us, our company. Our company's so good, and we're going to beat them. They're not going to beat the WWF. They're never going to beat them. And, you know, that's just a fact. Sorry. But that it's like the Uncle Dave type of mentality where they can't just, you know, say, you know, God damn, that was the shits. I did segments of OVW that I wish I'd never had to broadcast. I could admit it. But I didn't goddamn replay them and build on them every fucking week. Anyway, that that's the thing is that just MJF is so good at delivering any verbiage. But this is not the personality that was special. It's a manufactured, forced personality because the people started loving him so much as a heel because he was so much more interesting than everybody else on a fucking show. So then the lights went out. 
And then it, we could see because of flickering spotlights. So they've added a treatment now. Four black hooded goons hit the ring and attack MJF and get him down and hold him. Three of them hold him. And one of them has a baseball bat. And the one of them that has the baseball bat has the... They're all dressed identically, all in black. Black, 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 everywhere, black hoods. But the devil mask guy had the baseball bat. And there was, there's only the, only the one has the devil mask, right? What are they wearing? They're just in black bodysuits. Yes, but the one, the the leader, the the de the head he devil. Has, he has a mask that AEW has established as being the mask of the devil because MJF wore it when he came out on yes. stage to sympathy for the devil. And someone stole it from his bag because he carries it around. Correct. And now they wear it and they lead this faction of uh, Dark Order outcasts. That's that's what I was trying to convey there. But the thing is, the three guys holding him, all dressed in black, the guy in the black and the devil mask, he's got a baseball bat. Remember the last time that we saw the, the devil guy several weeks ago, however long, it's the first time we saw him definitely, and then we saw him again, but the first time I noticed definitely, he was a smaller fellow, right? Kind of a slight guy. It seemed like it, I think, with the first appearance after the stealing of the mask. Well, this guy was bigger. A uh, bigger and, and, and more, more impressive physically. Of course, we didn't get a chance to see him do anything because as he was wielding or brandishing the baseball bat there, Joe's music plays, and here comes Samoa Joe, and he grabs the guy by the legs and pulls him out and takes his bat. <laughs> and then... At that point, the screen went to black and there was neither audio nor video for, I counted, 13 seconds. You could see live, the bugs live and TBS or whatever, but there was nothing else going on. It was like they lost the feed, but it was 13 seconds of dead air and black screen and television. It's a while. And then suddenly, words start appearing on the screen. They're being typed up with sound effects. And they challenge MJF and Samoa Joe as a duo to face the unknown in a tag team match next week. And then we come back to the ring and the proper lighting and everything, and there's Samoa Joe and MJF standing in the ring. Now, there was no explanation as to how the fucking four hooded felons were routed and dispatched. And MJF is flipping out now, doing the Ric Flair when he knows that everything else has been boring and he's trying too hard promo. And he says he's going to take out all of the devil's men one by one and says yes to the tag team match. And Samoa Joe is not happy about that. Like, what? You're agreeing with me? And then the announcers suddenly, there was a static sound effect. And the announcers are back in saying, uh, we're sorry we were offline for a few minutes. Or however long. <sighs> Black Scorpion. The only thing he hadn't done is turn the guy's fucking head around out of the audience. 360. Everything. It's, and the thing is, here's what I was going to say. Uh, first of all, about this segment. Yes, we love the idea of Samoa Joe and... MJF facing each other because first one was good and both guys can talk and et, et cetera. The booking of this has been so back and forth and with this goofy devil shit going on and at the same time with the specter of Adam Cole and Roderick Strong and the Ring of Honor tag team belts and all this other hokey mid-card underneath bullshit tying up MJF's various attentions and then he gets hurt against one of these fucking 
glorified into yahoos and he may potentially have to have surgery one would think to correct that issue at some point it will be necessary but he's still going to go into this pay-per-view match legitimately injured you know with a guy Samoa Joe is a great worker but they work a physical style or did in their first one and you know and at the same time Tony is allowing him to be presented in this fashion where he is outdeviled by all these different heels and now is coming off like a whiny little prick that's gone through some kind of psychoanalysis to determine that he needs to change his ways. I'm just disheartened by this whole thing. Like I said before, I think with MJF, a lot of people, whether it's MJF himself, whether it's Tony Khan, whether it's whoever else there works with him on this stuff, I think a lot of stuff has been overthought. And simplicity is your friend. And MJF needs to somehow, with the belt or without it, get back to that. Well, can we talk about the devil? That's what I was going to say. Uh, I, I have a... I have a theory that sounds like it might fit based on something that somebody tweeted. Would you like to hear that theory? Yeah, I don't know where you're going, sure. Because right after, not right after, but there was a commercial break or whatever, but within minutes after this angle where the big guy with the in the black hood and the black outfit and the baseball bat tried to accost MJF, Wardlow came out right at the top of the nine o'clock hour. And there was a fellow on Twitter. Was it Vince McMahon's thoughts? I can't remember. But uh, he put a picture of the guy holding the bat in the ring and then a picture of Wardlow coming down the ramp for his match. And Wardlow's hair is all flattened down but poofed up at the same time. And he said, it's what it looks like when you've just pulled your mask off, pal, or what pulling your mask off does to your hair, pal. Wardlow is around. He's power bombing people. He's a heel. He knocked Tony Schiavone down on his elderly ass the other week. He has no regard for other people's safety anymore, and he said he was going to get even with MJF, but he's never one that attacks him. He never interacts directly with MJF past a couple of weeks ago when he snatched him backstage. Now, a lot of people were thinking that old Jungle Jackoff was going to be the devil. Whether that had ever had any basis in fact, we don't know. But we ain't seen Jungle Jackoff, and with CM Punk now the hottest fucking talent in wrestling, we probably never shall again because he's the one that caused Tony to lose the hottest name in the fucking business. Did they change their mind and they say, well, you know, Wardlow would fit that suit also. Maybe we'll just stick Wardlow under there and see what happens. That way, it still makes sense because Wardlow said he was going to fuck MJF up. Well, I remind you that even the Black Scorpion, there were several people under the mask until Ric Flair finally was revealed as the Black Scorpion. The, yes, and that is very true also. So Wardlow was under the mask. Someone else possibly was under Al the mask. Al Perez was a Black Scorpion. That's right. Wardlow, it's a very big change in character. If all of a sudden he's not confronting things head on, he wears a mask and he has a click. I don't think... I mean, I hope that's well, not see, it. Well, I didn't say it was going to make sense. I said if, they have, if they've changed their mind from what they originally had, now they're trying to find somebody that fits the suit. And it all ain't going to fit, but they can try. Now, beyond Wardlow, there are various options that it could possibly be. None of them are really good. And again, the payoff has to be good for any of this to be good because it's been getting worse and worse. <laughs> you brought up Jungle Boy. I think that's kind of a false flag when they did Anthony Bowens through the glass window and everyone's like, you see glass, glass. <laughs> I think it would be a letdown. I think too many people already are guessing Jungle Boy. And I think, unfortunately, it would make people just think of CM Punk. That's what Jungle Boy is going to do now on. If he ever does show his loincloth again, he's going to get ridiculous CM Punk chants. 
So I don't think Jungle Boy. You brought up Wardlow. Let me hit you with a few other names. One of the first names everyone guessed, Adam Cole. Well, but... That this would be his way of turning on the devil by taking the devil's mask and orchestrating a series of attacks on other people too, right? They attacked... uh, Who'd they attack in the back? Was it Taven and Bennett or was it someone else? Well, that might that might have been the original intent. I can't remember whether yes, that this thing started even before Adam broke his ankle. But he can't be the devil now, because not only would the devil be limping along with he'd be swinging a cane instead of a ball bat. Adam's surgery there has to be a payoff before next summer or fall. And does anybody expect him back in the ring before then? If that. So it can't be Adam Cole. Yeah, they can't. By the way, I just don't think they can do the devil thing for that long. People will really it, hate it. Well, yeah, and it couldn't be Adam Cole uh, announcing that he had hired people to do this for him because he was injured because it started before he got hurt. It, uh, well, another I mean, op- they, can, they can do anything. Another option people thought is maybe MJF is still the devil and he's playing a trick on everyone else for some reason. Now, that sounds like an idea that Tony would have, and that's why it scares me. That may be uh, the most likely thing so far, just because it makes absolutely no fucking sense whatsoever. The first time we saw the person who stole the devil's mask, they seemed rather slight. Some people think maybe it will be... Are you, to- are you, are you saying slim, uh, yeah. light at body weight when you say slight? Yes, not a big wrestler. Some people think it may be Tony Khan himself. Oh boy! Um, as much as I would like to, there's your bidding war. The bidding war for 2024 will be the (laughs) devil is Tony Khan against MJF. Now, as much as I would like to ascribe any bad idea, if at all possible, to Tony Khan, no. Number one, I don't think he would dare. I don't. Well, not dare. I don't think he would ever agree to being a heel to his fans, and I don't think any of his sycophants would let him do that so no it ain't tony khan what about a member of the elite kenny omega that just, no that makes absolutely i mean anything's possible again when you're not trying to make sense and you're probably changing from the original idea but no that makes no sense whatsoever let me hit you with one i've been thinking about a little bit recently dr Britt baker <laughs> dmd i'm not saying this is a good idea but i I could see these guys convincing themselves that it is. Someone stole the mask. Someone who wants to hurt MJF. Someone who wants to get MJF away from Adam Cole. Someone who's also hurting their other friends. Rip Baker hasn't been on TV in a while. She just put out a tweet complaining about how much promo time MJF gets. Everyone knows she's Adam Cole's girlfriend. Everyone knows that Tony Khan loves Adam Cole. He's had a good relationship with Britt. What would happen? If there's some kind of match, maybe it's the World's End match with Samoa Joe and the devil gets in the ring, pulls off the mask, rather slight, you know, it's not some big wrestler, and it's Dr. Britt Baker. And then she reveals that while they were in the south of France, she caught MJF and Adam Cole in bed together. Whoa, I didn't and say all, that. That was Bianca Jagger. I'm sorry. And it was it was Mick and David Bowie, wasn't no, it? You, you got the whole story wrong. It was Angie Bowie, and she claimed she caught Mick and David Bowie in bed. Ah, well, it was Angie Bowie. Bianca Jagger was too busy doing coke and hanging out with Warhol and the gang. Well, there you go, Warhol. See, <laughs> that's wasn't that the name of a job guy they used, Warhol? No, that was Warhorse. That was Warhorse. Yeah, he ruled ass. That's why they called him Warhol. But anyway, instead of Warhol, we have Wardlow here. But we're talking about the. Devil All right, we're talking who about be. Britt Baker. You know, with that, uh, that would be classic if if Britt Baker was jealous of the relationship that had developed between MJF and Adam Cole and decided to infiltrate it from behind the mask of the devil. But then, what's the payoff? How could there ever be? No, a there payoff? is none. But there ain't gonna be a payoff in this fucking thing anyway. <laughs> there is gonna be no fucking payoff. But no, by the time that this thing blows off, it will be a goddamn popcorn fart instead of an explosion. It will be the powder is already wet, and everybody's lost their matches. 
And so there's going to be no payoff anyway, but at least we could laugh. I can't think of any other options off the top of my head. I mean, obviously there are random people that it could be like Will Ospreay just showed up, but that would make no sense whatsoever. But I think they may have booked themselves into a problem here, but we'll see. Well, you know, and then actually not only that, but at least they're trying to explain the the technical things that are going on. They're trying to explain how the lights are going on and off and how these words come up on the screen and how the devil is able to project his visage it's Tony. to various places. See, that's how it well, would make sense if it was Tony Khan. Well, that's well, but it's it here's the thing. Here's the thing. It may not be Tony Khan, but it may be somebody close to him because they, they go to the break. And after the break, they come back and there's old Sockface, their lead announcer, saying that they just found out that it's an internal matter. That's a quote. And whoever this is that's been doing this has the capability to tap into their lighting and their video feed. So they, they're they trying to... But again, I think that's a red herring on the Tony Khan. I think they're just trying to close up the loophole that we have fucking screamed about since the time that we first saw it and then how these people pull this shit off, right? So they're trying to have old Sockface close that up, that somebody internally has the capability to tap into their lighting and their feed. That's what they're saying. Is it the same internal problem for the House of Black? Well, it's probably a different in, a different intern. Did you see, you didn't see the Julia Hart match on Collision this week, did you? Or the Julia oh, yeah, Hart no, appearance, no, did you? the lights went on and then she appeared behind old... Uh, Abaddon. Yeah, Abaddon, Abandon, whatever. And then the lights went off and she disappeared. She disappeared and the fans sitting at ringside were laughing, pointing under the ring. They were pointing yeah, to the they, fucking ring apron. They're like, she went under there. We <laughs> saw it. Because, you know, the blackout is easier to manage on television than it is live in the arena when they've still got emergency exit signs and things yeah. like that. So that's, you know, we went through that with getting The Undertaker and Mick Foley and those guys under the ring 25 years ago. But you know what this whole thing means, though, don't you, Brian? This, this whole thing? thing, this whole thing about it being an internal matter, the the devil has the capability to tap into the lighting and the video feed and the house of black, turning the lights on and off willy nilly, and people's music being played at random and all these other type of things. It means that Tony Khan does not subscribe to ExpressVPN. What do you mean? If Tony Khan was subscribing to ExpressVPN then the devil would not be able to hack into his satellite feed, into his video truck, into his television production facilities. He wouldn't be able to tap into the lighting grid because ExpressVPN would make the devil think that the lighting grid is located in Russia or in Cambodia or maybe even on the Isle of Malta. And the devil, he would never be able to find exactly where tony was because lord know the live ticket purchasing patrons can't find where the aew show's been taking place so how would the devil be able to find it if tony subscribed to express vpn to scrambulate and tabulate all of his signals into another route so that he would be untraceable because that's what they do express vpn doesn't want you people to be found out you people and your perverse picadillos and the type of websites that you like to frequent and visit what and linger over and lust after and pant heavily about i don't know who you're talking about our audience may want to access fine movies or television shows that are not available domestically like the great british sewing bee or various albums or all the all the programs movies. on the tip of your tongue so That's many right. titles that you can't or it just may be that they want to cover up their late night naughty searches in case the CIA, the FBI, the IRS, or any other governmental agency comes looking. Or potentially your significant other agency that lives in the same house and might be looking over your shoulder. You scramble all this shit up, she'll think you're in Cambodia. Because private mode, which is a thing I understand that you can set on your devices doesn't keep your activity private from your internet provider the at&t's the verizons they can see all the websites that you're clicking on 
They know exactly where you're flicking your switch and what it takes for you to do it. And they're probably selling it to all the advertisers. That's why many of you out there may be getting these advertisements for penis enlargers. And you know who what? else can see everything? Who? Whoever owns the Wi-Fi that you're using. If you're on your school's Wi-Fi or your parents' Wi-Fi, your boss's Wi-Fi, well, you can get Wi-Fi to death with a situation like that, but with ExpressVPN, you become invisible. It all goes through an encrypted server. You're rerouted. You're bypassed. You're, your veins and fucking jugulars are being all reconverted into different streams. No. So that nobody knows where you're at. Well, again, yeah. there's, there's elements of that that work and are true, but nothing will be done to the actual body or the internal organs of the listeners. Well, metaphorically speaking. Ah. See, that's, that's why. You know, you're all metaphorical. But for all of you who've been metaphoring to nasty websites, now's your chance to cover it up. But for the holidays, folks, take yourself off the naughty list with the number one rated VPN. Just go to expressvpn.com slash JCE. You're going to get three extra months for free expressvpn.com slash jce three extra months absolutely free because they don't want you to get in trouble at just as much as we do and yes you can see all of those block tv programs from other regions and parts of the world because you're fooling everybody here but most importantly you're fooling the people that count your loved ones or something like that, but if you want to access fine programming or websites from all around the world and do it safely and privately, ExpressVPN. What's that promo code? One more time, Jim. Promo code, well, it's slash JCE, which is the same thing as a promo. ExpressVPN.com slash JCE. So don't get caught flogging the bishop or flicking the bean when you don't need to. ExpressVPN. Well, I know with all the action and excitement that we've recounted that people think, well, that must have been the whole program. And no, we're only at the 9 o'clock hour, folks. Because at the top of the 9 o'clock hour, you know they always put in a big match or a big star or something to hook the new viewers that may have finished a previous program and want to check things out. So this main event was Wardlow versus A.R. Fox. At the top of nine o'clock, do you think, do you think that they mismanaged their time and they thought that the MJF and Joe thing was still going to be going on? Or what, what would, well, I mean, they had an overrun, so they ran late, but what would, what would make somebody put this on nine o'clock on purpose, a squash match and the, How long he was power bombs the guy, the referee stops it and he walks out of the building. Well, how long? Moxley and Lethal was like 20 minutes, wasn't it? Or close to it? Oh, it seemed like forever. And so was the Roosh match. So I don't know what could have run short. I don't, maybe this was on purpose and he's just crazy. That's, that's a possibility. But that's what happened. And then to celebrate the return of Dante Martin from a fucking broken leg where his, uh, to remind everybody, because they did, they showed the VTR of it. I couldn't fucking, watch. I didn't watch it. He had his leg broken and it, his foot turned around and f was flopping in the complete opposite direction. But one would think that that would happen because he let a fucking idiot penthouse give him a goddamn Canadian destroyer off a ladder through a table onto the floor. But you have so to be an idiot to take it, so it's both guys' fault. Well, no, you got to be an idiot to do it to somebody, and you got to be an... I was about to say, and Dante Mor... Um, Dante Moron. <laughs> Dante Moron, that'll be his NXT Well, name. there you go. Um, <laughs> he's just as, as much at fault because he let somebody do it to him, but you could have hurt yourself doing it to somebody because it was stupid. And there was no reason for it. So that was last March. He's just come back. And now we were treated to the, the origin story of Broken Mad Hardy's discontent. They actually booked on television Matt and Jay Hardy and Brother Zay, who Jeff used Hardy. to be 
What did I say? Jay Hardy. Matt and Jay Hardy. Sorry about that. Matt and Jeff Hardy and Brother Zay. See, Jay Zay, whatever, who used to be Isaiah Cassidy before his partner got hurt, mysteriously disappeared somewhere. And I guess he was teamed with the Hardys because he was one of the underneath guys that fucking Matt Hardy, when he was a crooked manager, was trying to bilk out of his money on a contract. So they're still together. But now it's the Hardy boys together with Brother Zay. And they wrestled the returning Dante Moron and his brother Darius and that superstar that Jericho created, Action Andretti. I said, who are the fucking baby faces? Who well, are we supposed to be cheering for? Well, clearly top flighter baby faces because they're hometown boys. Then why put them against the fucking Hardys? I what can't explain What sense that. did this make? And apparently the way it was designed, and now after Matt's tweet, we may know a little bit more about why, they wiped Matt and Jeff out on the floor with something, and they just stayed there. And then all three of the other baby faces, Andretti and the Martins, did repeated shit to Zay. <laughs> and so it was three baby faces kicking the shit out of one baby face, and then they beat him one, two, three, and you never saw the Hardys again, which was probably the only way they would agree to be involved in that thing. So that's obviously what pissed Matt off and led to that tweet that happened a day or two later. And this was the most ridiculous matchmaking. And why would you do this? That was a running theme in the program. Do you have an answer? I can go on. No, like you said, you can certainly understand why the Hardys would be frustrated, specifically this week. We last saw Action Andretti <laughs> dropping Roddy Strong on his head. Forgot about that. Oh, that's right. That's right. Nothing else you can really say here. Uh, the Martins are back together as a tag team. Usually they have a good three or four week run before one of them gets hurt. Yeah. So hopefully this is a good four weeks. And, uh, you know, that's one of the few teams I'd like to see in there with FTR. Not just one match, but something where these guys can actually learn from FTR. If, if they are kids that will be quiet and listen, I bet FTR could get yeah. the best thing out of them they could get. You know, I said the but, other day there was nothing with FTR I really was interested in. I'd be interested in that. Well, we'll never see that. <laughs> it, unless they beat FTR, then we might see it. But you said there was nothing really that they could say. Well, that's apparent because after we came back from the break, Renee Moxley Good was in the back with the Martins and Andretti. And there was nothing they could say but because <laughs> before they could speak a word in Walk's penthouse. The motherfucker that crippled this guy to begin with. I'd never want to see him again, right? And he comes in with Alex, and he brings in, I give Felix, his brother, and either Gravity or Commander or Der Commissar or whoever the fuck the other guy was. Felix is his brother. Penthouse's brother. Yeah, you said Felix's brother came out. And no, I said he brings in Felix, his brother. Oh, I thought you said Felix's brother. Like no, Felix is his stories. brother. Yes. And the other guy was, was one of the people that wears a mask and fucking has a weird name. Like I said, Gravity or Commander or De Commissar or whoever the fuck. And he, he counted to three. <laughs> he challenged for a six-man tag team match by counting to three. Penthouse points at each one of them, says one two, three, and then he points at them himself, one, and his other guys, two, three. So he challenged them for a six mat. That was the segment that the Hardys put this fucking team over to get to. Did you like the TBS title match between Julia Hart and Emmy Mercury? Well, she's not wearing the mustache anymore, although she still has the crown and the cape of a... Uh... Royal Freddie Mercury. I think she's eating too much margarine. Well, she's back, and uh, usually when she's back, she's on a lot, and then she goes away again. Well, I'll tell you, next to Emmy, 
Julia Hart looks like Rhea Ripley. Because Emmy looks like they dressed up a pudgy dollar store cashier and said, go out there and imitate wrestling moves. And But th the reason I even remark about this match is because of the finish. Did you pay any attention to it at all? I don't think so, but you're going to mention it, and I'm going to remember that I saw it. Julia Hart goes for a moonsault, because that's her finish, right? Right, I did see that. But Emmy is way too close to the turnbuckle. And as she's laying there, she realizes that Julia is going to, when she does the moonsault, the backflip, she's going to overshoot her. So as Julia is in midair, <laughs> Emmy tries to, like the 3,000 people that are in this building or whatever are not going to notice. Emmy thinks if she just rolls over once and <laughs> that she'll be in the right place. But as she tries to roll over once, she rolled over on her stomach and only got a half of a roll before Julia landed on her. Julia hit the moonsault on Emmy's back and they both kind of landed in a heap and the fans couldn't tell who got hurt. And then Julia just rolled her over and covered her one, two, three. I did see so, this, yes. So it looked like she thought, I'll just do a complete revolution laying here flat on my back and end up in the exact right place for her to land on me and started too late. So then... Are the House of Black baby faces or heels? It depends on who's in there. Julia Hart's a baby face because this is a bunch of sexually frustrated guys that are either afraid to or unable to get laid. And that's, you know, their dream girl. There's more but, to it than that, but that may be a portion of the audience. Well, whichever portion of the audience I'm thinking about is the one that they're thinking with also about Julia Hart. But when the other fucking bleckers get in there... Without her, it's, you know, eh. Anyway, did you want to talk about the big showdown, the big heart-rendering, English-rendering showdown discussion between Edge and Christian Cage? Well, I think we have to talk about it. I'll just say one thing and then let you say everything. I think if you looked at our audience, and it's a pretty big audience, maybe 95% of the audience could have booked an Adam Copeland Christian Cage feud better than whatever <laughs> we've seen play out on AEW TV. Which, again, simplicity is your friend, wrestling bookers and uh, sons of billionaires. Simplicity is your friend. He can't be simple because the medicine doesn't slow the brain down that far for him to be simple and tell a story that everyone would understand and want to hear. Yeah. It's bouncing off of the insides of his brain like a fucking bullet ricocheting off the inside of a grain silo. So Christian Cage comes to the ring with five security guards who are obviously outlaw wrestlers because you can tell them a mile away. And one guy had on high waters that looked like he was wearing fucking Lord Littlebrook's pants. And it, they invited, or he invited, Christian did, Edge into the ring to speak to him. He said, if you don't mind making your presence felt. And they're listening or they're trying to put a little logic and realism in this because he called him, he didn't come out. And Christian gets flustered and calls him out again, calls for his truck, play his music, nothing. So at least it wasn't set up, but the problem was that Christian hadn't thought of a lot of real entertaining shit to keep him busy while we were waiting for him to come out. But nevertheless, then they play the music and out comes Biker Edge. He's wearing a fucking knit cap and goddamn leather vest and a fucking heavy metal t-shirt of some description and blue jeans. He looks like he just came from a Hells Angels rally. Was this guy not in the WWE last year wearing a long sequined robe? Looking like a star instead of a fucking biker? Maybe he moved to the mean part of Toronto. No, he moved to the bad side of Asheville. Actually, I guess he probably would find some bikers over there at the mean side of Asheville. Because the polo ponies don't roam free. They're on the menu at the corner diner. But anyway, so then Christian hides behind the security when Edge gets in the ring. And then he tells him, wait a minute. I want to talk to you. Security leave. And they leave the ring. And Edge does not 
in any way advance on Christian. Christian backs up in the corner with nothing in between him but air and opportunity. And he says, we're not going to make it to the match in Montreal on December 6th, which is this coming week, or this week as we're in it, for our match that we're going to have because I'm sorry. And the crowd immediately starts chanting bullshit. And then Christian says, well, Biker Adam Copeland seemed to kind of believe it. Well, you know, he was, he was being contemplative, Adam Copeland. Contemplative Copeland. The biker. Yes. Contemplative Co Copeland used to be on the uh, evangelist, ev evangelistic circuit with Armageddon T. Thunderbird, but nevertheless. It's amazing what Gum Alley does to a man. <laughs> oh, he was, it was a revelation. So Christian says that Edge took out Dino and he took out Nick. So, Christian, he went for a drive and he reflected and soul-searched. How did I become this person? Who am I? Let me clarify this. He told old road stories about their younger days together and how they used to take his mother's car places and do this and that and the other thing, and we were the greatest tag team ever. And Christian's father was like Edge's father, so they're brothers. And Christians, I love you, man. This was not only extremely long, but nobody was buying it except Edge looked like he was actually thinking about it, trying to milk the suspense. It was long, wasn't it, Brian? It certainly was, and it's important to note that although a lot of people love Christian's performance in these things, this is two weeks in a row with a long, never-ending, not-good segment. Yes. That just never ends. And I've said he's a Bond villain. He's been my favorite fucking heel on the program, and he's a verbal wordsmith, but no. This and So Edge thinks about it. He's conflicted. And then after all this big apology and all this sob story and going back to when they were kids at their, their mommy's knee or whatever the fuck before edge even thinks about it and answers christian tries to hit him with the title belt and as he comes to swing edge just turns around and knees christian in the nuts and says nice try dumbass <laughs> next week i'm gonna win that belt and by the way here's something else go fuck yourself and that was not muted at all, but then three seconds later, there was a long three or four <laughs> second audio mute. So you can tell that even the fucking guy, he's got one job. There's a seven second delay and you got your finger on the fucking button. You got one job, but he was so bored and zoned out by all this caca and fake drama that had gone on before that by the time he heard fuck, it had already gone out to America. And then he bleeped whatever the fuck else was said. And that was that. Was that. What'd you think, Brian? Not everyone could pull off Go Fuck Yourself. <laughs> I grew up in the Northeast. I'd like to think I could pull it off. Adam Copeland, not so much. You know, it reminded me, the way you broke it down... Christian just turning on him with the belt. I mean, why do all of this to do that? It's so dumb. It's like when Callis turned on Jericho because Jericho didn't turn on him. Yes. It's just overthought. But get the answer first. Let him say no first before you try to swing at him from behind. It may have worked. There are just ideas, it seems like, thrown against the wall and they go out of order and it doesn't matter. They just do it this way. I mean, we could talk more about this angle. What do you think about the fact they're doing the match next week or this coming week on Dynamite? Not on the pay-per-view, but on Dynamite. Well, because we, we, you got to get this young kid Copeland over. Put him on TV where people will see him and then put him in a pay-per-view match when they know who he is. Of course it's insane. They signed Edge and the ratings went down. That's not a reflection of Edge. That's a reflection of Tony going over the Edge. Nothing helps. It again, that's the thing. Give give this away. It's 20, 
Five years in the making. We have since Edge versus Christian has not happened since their tryout match in Toronto, where they got signed to a developmental deal in 1997. So he's putting it on fucking TV next week, at three weeks in front of a pay per view. Unless you thought that the Christian Darby stuff was so important that it needed to continue. And by the way, it seems like that's over now. Then there's no way this whole thing couldn't have been done better. And I meant it before and I said it. I bet the majority of this audience, if I said, or if you said, they don't listen to me. If you said there's an Adam Cole. Well, apparently boom, Daniel does. Hey, Daniel, does go he fuck hate yourself. you from hell's heart. Go fuck yourself, Daniel. But if you said book Adam Copeland, book Edge versus Christian. The big feud, finally. It wouldn't have been this. It's making me want to see them wrestle each other and do stuff less. Christian's getting go-away heat pretty quick because these segments are all going long. And then he always has now the fake, like, oh, oh my God, what? what uh? then, then in the middle of the thing, he doesn't know what's going on. He loses control. These are not good segments. And w when he was talking about himself and he had the dinosaur there as a backup, as a bodyguard and a flunky, that was great. But once we brought Nick Plain into the thing and there's more attention on these two and it's they're not good and he's not good talking more about them in this convoluted saga between him and, and his best friend Adam that could have, as you said, easily been told in a better and more realistic way yeah it's that it <sighs> seems like two best friends performing with each other that's the issue they keep showing all these photos of them in the past it still seems like two guys playing characters playing with each other hey wouldn't it be cool that you say this and i'll say that and then i'll say go fuck yourself tony you can get that right yeah no problem yeah. Yeah, we'll 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 tell the audio guy so he can bleep it. Go ahead and say it. <laughs> Didn't they get in trouble when Moxley literally said "Go fuck yourself" the first time on the air to a fan, and then Jericho tried to run with GFY the same week? Yeah, but Moxley had just said it, so you couldn't go with GFY because Moxley literally said "Go fuck yourself." And so he, I, I wonder if he had to pay for that trademark application that he had up for a week on GFY. Didn't they just bleep MJF? What did they bleep MJF saying to Joe? Well, the, blow me? Or what did he say? Blow me? Blow me got bleep. But here's the thing. There was a, a, a talk about months ago about the language, and they started cracking down on bleeping things, or we say bleep because that's what it used to be, but an audio mute where the sound just goes out. And it seemed like they got in line a little bit, and now not only are they having to mute everybody again, but they're missing the mutes. Those two mutes. Maybe this is a good time to remind you. I just went and looked it up. Remember we talked about in July that AEW was banning different things and they were going to have rules. <laughs> How many injuries ago was that? How many death defying freak accidents was that ago? You know, all of these things were banned without approval. Spots and bumps on the ring apron outside, table, ladder, and chair spots in and out of the ring. Elevated spots outside of the barricade. I'm trying to see anything about blood. Well, but uh, we've said many times you can drink the blood, but you can't throw the blood. Yeah, every, sing the every single thing here is something that we've seen on TV since July when we first saw this. Well, that's because it was bullshit because people were upset that everybody was getting hurt. So they put something out like they were going to do something about it. But there's nobody controlling any of these fucking guys. And we've. You know, we, 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 we've heard through the little grapevines that the producers are often frustrated, the ones with veteran experience, not the friends of the modern generation. And nobody's going to contain them from doing anything, and nobody's going to discipline them after they do anything, except for the disciplinary committee, which is headed up by a guy who's had two major injuries in the last year and was once forced to retire from wrestling for several years because of fucking head damage caused by concussions. He's in charge of the disciplinary committee if they get out of hand giving each other concussions and shit. You want to talk about the main event? AEW rolls on. Let's go to the main event. Because I don't want to talk about it. It was a tournament match with Swerve Strickland against Jay White. Remember I asked a minute ago who's the baby faces? Who's the fucking heel? 
Now they've got they got the people cheering Swerve, the guy who terrorizes infants in their cribs. And they want people to boo Jay White, who couldn't get fucking heat in a goddamn sauna with a can of gasoline. And and they're they're fighting. And within a minute, they're out on the floor and they're having a meaningless cold match between two heels that's going to do neither one any good. And they went over time and the DVR froze. And I believe a fine, upstanding journalist once said, it's not my job to record the overrun. It's not my job. It's not my job, man. It's Chico and the man. Chico, don't get discouraged. Uncle Dave is trying hard as he can. It's Chico, don't get discouraged. Cause Uncle Dave has lost his rabbit ass mind. <laughs> it's Chico and the man. Well, Swerve Strickland prevailed over Jay White. So so Swerve beats the guy that was just having a six week run as being better than the world heavyweight champion and stole the belt from him. He had the belt. He literally had the belt for several yeah. weeks. Yeah. So there you have that. So there, that program and that tournament and everything continues to drag on. Do we do we know how many people watched this episode? How many, 800 and what thousand people watched this television show? And did they lose 20%, 25 or 30% of the audience they start with? Well, we do have the ratings, Jim, for AEW Dynamite. On TBS, November 29th, a Wednesday. Of course it was. <laughs> AEW Dynamite on TBS was watched on average by 858,000 viewers. There you, it's it's got to have an eight in front of it these days. We're down to the to the most ardent admirers. They were up 2% compared to last week's total viewership of 845,000 viewers. Well, bless their little pee-picking hearts. Where'd they start? Well, these ratings were compiled by WrestleNomics, quarter 1, 8 to 8.15 p.m., Jay Lethal versus John Moxley with Picture in Picture, 969,000 viewers. Huge. Again, the big bangers. They come in, but they don't stay. Well, quarter two, 8.15, 8.30 p.m., the stay of Lethal versus Moxley, and then an Eddie Kingston promo backstage. That was the one where his giant beach ball stomach was stuck out and the angle they shot. No, I'm... It's the production people that they allowed that camera angle and they allowed that tape to air. It's their fault. It's not his fault for having a big stomach. It's their fault for fucking accentuating it. Followed by an ad break, followed by Sting and Ric Flair's backstage promo, 894,000 viewers. Okay, so the Moxley effect loses them 75,000 people before they can show everybody Ric Flair and Sting. And then we go to quarter three, 8.30 to 8.45 p.m., a match in the Continental Classic Tournament, Mark Briscoe versus Roosh, with picture-in-picture picture ads, and Tony Storm's backstage segment, 876,000 viewers. And that lost another uh, 18,000. Not bad, considering what was involved. We are now involved with quarter four, MJF's live promo with Samoa Joe and the Devil's involvement, an ad break, and the beginning of A.R. Fox versus Wardlow, 882,000 viewers. So therein lies the MJF effect, which we once talked about as it would be the highest rated quarter of the show, and now he gains... 6,000 viewers. That's what this MJF is doing to the reputation of the old MJF. And by the way, 9 o'clock while we're in the middle of AR Fox and Wardlow, where do they go at 9, up or down? Well, the big 9 o'clock hour, Jim, 9 to 9.15 p.m., quarter 5. The finish of AR Fox versus Wardlow, Brother Zay and the Hardys, Versus Action Andretti on Top Flight with picture in picture ads. 834,000 viewers. Uh, so, 
Jesus Christ, they lose 48,000 on a quarter involving Matt and Jeff Hardy. But with their presentation, as we've discussed many times these days, not surprising. So now the 9 o'clock hour is the low point of the program so far, and they've lost 135,000 viewers from the start. But wait, there's more. Okay. Quarter 6, 9.15 and 9.30 p.m. An ad break. Top Flight and the Lucha Brothers and El Hijo del Vikingo's backstage angle. It was Vikingo. Julia Hart versus Emi Sakura with picture-in-picture ads. And Mariah May's backstage segment. Good Lord. 789,000 viewers. No, uh, hold on. They got a gift there. That is 34, 4, 45,000 people they lost. For that segment, that's a fucking gift. That should have been below 600. Well, we then go to quarter 7, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m. The endless Christian Cage live promo and angle with Adam Copeland, as well as an ad break. 832,000 viewers. Okay, so Christian and, and Edge get back 43,000 of the 45,000 the previous clowns lost. But therein lies a problem. Now they know they've seen MJF, they've seen Edge, they've seen Christian. We got two heels wrestling. Why would we emotionally want to see either one of them win? That is a meaningless match. I predict doom and gloom for the eighth quarter. Well, we have the eighth quarter, 9.45 to 10 p.m., as well as a three-minute overrun. In the Continental Classic Gym, Swerve Strickland versus Jay White with picture-in-picture ads, 790,000 viewers, and for the three-minute overrun, 826,000 viewers. Okay, 790 again is a gift. That means they only lost (laughs) 42,000. And I can't believe that many people stuck with it at the end. The overrun is the other is the next program's audience that they didn't know that they were going to see three minutes of this wrestling match. And so you can't really say that suddenly 36,000 extra people switched over to watch the last three minutes of this. So maybe now we know why Tony's doing it and not scheduling it. Because that extra 36,000 people in some way increased their average, did it not? I would think so. We would actually have to sit here and do the math. which And know how to, to do, do the math. But uh, so do you th- is he doing this without telling the viewers? Because that way that gives them an artificial bump at the end. Because from start to finish of the scheduled program, they lost 179,000 people. Remember, Dave said the plan, and I'm doing air quotes, the plan from AEW was to not ask for an allotted extra 10 minutes. To just ask the network as they go that they need an extra few minutes. That's interesting. If it is a concerted effort by Tony Khan to artificially boost the number. Because he could clearly wrap the show up before then if he wanted to. And why why do something that you're going to do on television you want people to see and then not tell anybody that you, where they might miss it? But who's, <laughs> who's timing out the show? Whose job is it to time out the show? Who not? QT Marshall just quit. So maybe it's in the hands of, you know, fucking Ben. Who's, who's on the clock? Ben. Ben's at Gorilla. Whatever the hey, fuck. Hey, listen, Alvarez said it in that clip. It wasn't always perfect. Every now and then something happened. But for four years, they got it right with at least ending the show on time. Now they can't do it any week. Or announcing when they would be commercial free and or when they would have an overrun. But the point is they lost 179,000 from the start to the finish. 179,000 out of 969,000 is is more than 20%, right? Or maybe not. Well, nevertheless, I don't know how to do the math, but it's somewhere around there. It's less than 20%. It's about 20%. Are you trying to figure this out? I'm looking to see if there's anything in uh, WrestleNomics' data here, but I'm quickly scrolling through through things. I don't even know what I'm looking at. (laughs) Well, now just get your calculator and punch in 179,000 Divided by 969,000, and the answer will come to you. But that was dynamite. 